The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. So now you got to tell me how to do this, Dad. Just pour it straight through. So this is a wetland that we would classify as a seasonal wetland basin. Specifically the faucet snail is one you want to watch out for. It's a very small snail. And I want to show you a recipe that I have that works really well for me. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Over the years, anglers have had an uncanny ability to find ways to catch fish. New products and techniques arrive every year, but that doesn't mean you can't be just as successful or have just as much fun as going old school. Well, it's winter time in Minnesota. What do people here do in this state? Well, they hit the frozen water and they try to get fish out of the lake. That's what we're gonna do here today in the Park Rapids area, only we don't have any fishing poles with. Instead, we were on the lake to set gill nets for Tulabi with Jason Markla and his father, Mark. We got some of the guys back here right now. They've got a net in the water. If you notice, it's not very far off the shoreline here. And the reason for that is, is it's gotta be in six feet or less of water. And in the wintertime, those tulipy come up into the shallower water to spawn and all the game fish go out to deeper water. So you gotta do all your netting here where it's a little bit shallower. So they've had a net in the water. We're gonna see if we can get some fish in it. Once nets are set, typically they're left overnight and then checked every 24 hours. Just take the top part out and the weight dangles in the water. So leave the bottom of it in the water. Correct. Right. Okay. And then any any words of wisdom on not falling in the hole? <laughs> it's not falling in the hole. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. This is what they call getting skunked. Nothing. Not a thing. So now we're just gonna put the net back in mm -hmm. and reset it. All right. Yep. Yep. Nobody said finding these fish would be easy. The netting season is a narrow window when tulabee are typically in the shallows. By doing it this time of year, obviously you're concentrating them, but more importantly, the, the game fish have moved out to deeper water generally. It seems like something that's been a tradition for people, but it's maybe not the tradition that it used to be. Is, is it still as popular as it once was? Before 1980, license sales were quite a bit higher. Somewhere around late 1970s, early 1980s, we saw a decline in license sales. Since then, it's generally been hovering around a thousand. Tulabee, otherwise known as cisco or herring, along with whitefish, are generally thought of more as a forage for walleye, muskie, lake trout, and northern pike, despite being sought after table fare by the die-hard netters who continued the tradition. 20 years. 20 years you've been fishing yep. this lake. Females come in, and then the males will follow, and it's about a two-week span here, and then they're done. Since our first net didn't net any fish, we moved down the shore to set another one. We're just gonna auger a hole here? Yeah, to check the depth. Okay. Otherwise you have to go. Do you have a depth stick? What do you use? Yes, sir, right there, they're marked. Okay. The red mark is six feet. Okay. Okay, we're good. Don't we can stay at five here. feet or move it that way. Six feet is prime. We'll or let's, let's go six. Let's just start on this one here and then we have to go that way. A rope measured out to 100 feet is used to mark where the net will be placed. A straight show. line up to right where he's standing. Okay. Can't have any beer till after five. 
You sure you know what you're doing with that thing? I do not. All right, good. Let's run it. All right. Fire it up. After using a chainsaw to cut large holes for each end of your net, an auger drills a series of holes in between. The reason for this spacing between each hole is because that's how long that stick is. And they gotta pass that stick underneath and be able to reach it at each hole, so those holes are as far apart as that stick is long. Okay, we got it here. The rope is then attached to the pole, which then pulls the 100-foot net down into the lake. Once the net is in, two long poles hold it in place. So there's the end of our net right there. So then these poles on the front and the back uh, hold that net up so it holds it open on each end. Right. So our net's in place. Now we just sit back and wait for all the fish to show up, right? That's the, that's the funnest part of this sport, <laughs> waiting. I like it. The waiting can be the best part when you do it in a fish house. What's the most fish you've ever pulled out of one of those nets? 80 fish. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. My nephew and I, uh, because it takes two people to do it, so he was probably 20 years old. And he was down here, lives in Virginia. So I says, Steve, I need some help. What do you mean help? With fishing. So I'll buy your license for you. He says, no, I got money. So he bought his own license, we bought a license, we went, and he's, you probably won't catch anything. So we put the net in for one day, and the next morning we had 80 tulipies. So then... The legend was born. I thought it was harder than it was. Today went really smooth. Just like, wow, this is a... You guys made this sound really hard. No wonder nobody wants to try this. <laughs> I mean, a gill net's 130 bucks, and you could use an ax, you know, you can get an ax for 20 bucks. But we had, you know, we used a chainsaw because it was easier. Uh, it's not, I don't, I don't know, a couple kids sleds and a, some, you know, gloves. I don't know, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's that expensive. We headed back out the next day, hopeful we'd find fish in the net. I can, I can clearly see right through the hole there. There's there's a fish down at the bottom right there. What did we do? We just left that bottom right in there, didn't we? Yeah, yep, yeah, leave the bottom in. Right. So now you gotta tell me how to do this, Dad. Just pull it straight through. There you go. One, you know, pretty good size. <laughs> Looks like you're female. I think Minnesota is so walleye focused that we neglect a lot of fish species that are make awesome table fare. I, I don't, I know nobody my age or younger that does this. Five tulipies not great, but I mean it's it's a start means they're still running. Well, it's better to poke in the eye. Makes it worthwhile. And the people we talk about, and they're just, you know, it's a, just an older style of, you know, catching. And uh, I think it's pretty cool to keep that alive. So it was important to, to see it, you know, and do it for me. Now that we had our fish, it was time to get them in the smoker. Yeah, that well, that's the whole other half of it, right? I mean, it's like, you have all you have these fish, and now it's time to to do something with them. Yeah, we're gonna prepare them for the brine, um, and then to smoke them in half. So, see, the reason you cut the back in half, the smoke's easier, more even. Cleaning tulipies is easy. After removing the head, you slice the fish in half, starting at the top, leaving it attached at the stomach. After giving the inside a good rinse, it's ready for the brine. All right. 
The next step in the process is we need to make a brine. So we got some pre-measured out ingredients here. We got four cups of water. We got a cup of soy sauce. Soy sauce makes everything taste good. We got a quarter cup of uh, salt. Three quarters cup uh, brown sugar. A tablespoon of garlic. But before we bring it to the stove, we gotta add some rooster lager to make this our own. Cooking with beer is always fun, especially when you get to have one. <laughs> Give that a light stir. Now we're gonna have to put this on the stove and boil it and then let it cool before we pour it over the fish. And we'll actually brine it in this pan and just cover it in the fridge for 24 hours. And you, then you put them in the smoker skin side down? Yes, skin side down with the old poplar trees. He's the best smoker. 180 and 200 for three and a half hours and it comes out looking like this. Yes. Looks delicious. I mean, it is just like eating trout. It tastes like that. It's got that same kind of consistency mm. to it. I can't believe more people don't do this. Well, around here they do. <laughs> Park Rapids, you guys got to figure it out. Mm. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. It's been a great time. You're welcome. And I don't know what you guys are going to eat, but I'm taking this with me. <laughs> <laughs> Different lakes in Minnesota have varying regulations on netting tulipy and whitefish. Check the DNR's website to find out how you can get out and enjoy this tradition that involves a unique way of targeting some delicious fish. Because it grows so aggressively and so quickly, it can really overtake all the native vegetation that we would have had in those wetland basins. The first thing you want to do when you take the boat out is you just want to visually walk around and inspect the boat. American cheese, you just might have to add a little more butter, maybe a little more water. Prairie Sportsman's logo features the iconic cattail that is abundant in Minnesota's wetlands. Where there are cattails, there are waterfowl, or so we thought. The native broadleaf cattails that have dotted our wetlands are being replaced by invasive narrowleaf cattails that are choking our wetlands, and in some cases, making them uninhabitable for ducks. It's sort of a, a double whammy. We've lost a lot of wetland acreage across the state. And then the wetlands that are left are not always in the greatest condition. And whether that's water quality or invasive species like cattail, you know, it, what we have left is not always in the best, in the best shape. The broadleaf cattail, it likes a little bit different habitat than the narrowleaf cattail does. And so, um, for example, it's not as tolerant to big fluctuations or deeper water levels. It's got a narrower kind of happy zone for how deep the water can be, where our hybrid and the narrowleaf cattail is, it can, it's compatible with a much bigger range of, of water depth conditions, and so it can persist in places where that broadleaf just couldn't before. Because it grows so aggressively and so quickly, it can really overtake all the native vegetation that we would have had in those wetland basins. Um, the new leaves grow really fast and really vigorously, but the old dead stuff doesn't decay very fast. It takes a long time to decay under, in, down at the bottom there. And so you end up having this real buildup of, of litter, we call it, or that duff layer gets built up and built up and built up. And it can actually completely shade out the whole area so that nothing else has a chance to grow in there. They use a lot of water and they do a lot of what we call evapotranspiration. So water evaporates just from the surface of the pond but then water also leaves a pond by going through the plant um, and getting transpired through the plant. Because of that thick root layer, dust layer that's in there, and because it's taking up water so much faster, um, we can end up having wetlands that end up getting dry a lot sooner in the season than they would normally. Plants that would have been in the spot where that narrowleaf cattail is growing are things like hard stem bulrush, soft stem bulrush, some of the others, some of the broadleaf sedge plants that we would have had in there. So yeah, definitely replacing some of the native native wetland plants. What that means in the end is that all of the different kinds of birds and other kinds of wildlife and you know for us ducks we're concerned about, they evolved with that original vegetation that was there. They like to have more sparse vegetation where they can swim in between stems of plants for example and when you get that really thick duff 
matted up layer growing in there, essentially. It's taking away habitat from, from waterfowl. Where did all these invasive cattails come from? The botanists are always kind of arguing about this kind of stuff. Um, so they, they think that it originally came from Europe um, and, and then it sure showed up first in the United States in the eastern part of the country um, and then just really slowly over time moved its way west. It didn't really show up here probably until the mid middle part of the 1900s. So um, you know, if we talked to our grandparents about it, they wouldn't really remember seeing this much cattail in wetlands. That would have been different than what they would have seen in, so, you know, example in the 30s and 40s. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife's Morris Wetland Management District is working to control narrowleaf cattails and a hybrid cross between native and exotic species. So we've done some targeted timing on burning and grazing, for example, doing it more in the fall when the water levels are lower hoping we'll get a bigger effect on the cattails at that time. We do things like spraying the cattail with an herbicide. It's a um, Roundup. There's an aquatic version of Roundup called Rodeo. And so they'll just go out and directly spray that either with a helicopter or with um, an amphibious vehicle like a Marshmaster. Um, we also will sometimes go out and actually scrape the cattail biomass right out of the wetland if it gets really overchoked. That works well in, in the shallower basins where it's a, more of a seasonal type wetland and it's gonna dry up later in the fall and allow us to get in there with heavy equipment and just push all that stuff right out of the basin. Typically the, um, the ideal time to start to control cattail in those more direct ways are um, like late summer, um, kind of right when it's flowering, it's used up all of its reserves of, of energy that it stores in the roots underground or you know down in the soil over the winter. Um, and so if you can do something to go in and control it at that time, that's the most effective because it doesn't have as much of a chance to recover from that treatment that you do. If we're doing our best, we really have to prioritize where we target some of these activities and we really try to focus on areas that we know are important for waterfowl especially. So that's how we decide where we're going to spend our, our energy and our funds on cattail management. To show us what duck habitat should look like, Sarah took us to a restored wetland near Morris. So this is a wetland that we would classify as a seasonal wetland basin and that means that it in a typical year is going to have standing water in it for maybe about half of the summer um, and then dry up towards the end of the summer. We've had a lot of rain, so there's some water in here now, but um, these, when you're talking about waterfall breeding, these wetlands, these seasonal wetlands are really important for pear habitat. They tend to be a little bit more shallow and so they thaw out the earliest in the spring. And so when a pair of ducks show up from their southern breeding grounds and they're flying across looking for a place to set up a home range for breeding that season, what they're really typically keying in on is how many of these seasonal wetlands are in that landscape. And for those of us that like to strap on camo in the fall, restored wetlands mean more ducks and more enjoyment in the field. So fishermen aren't the only ones that have to be uh, aware of AIS and AIS regulations. Duck hunters should think about that too, shouldn't they? Yeah, they should. Um, duck hunters specifically spend a lot of time in our bodies of water, whether they're infested or not. Um, a lot of time with the vegetation and definitely move around between different bodies of water, which makes it increasingly important to check for AIS. So when they take their boat out of the water, what should they do? The first thing you want to do when you take the boat out is you just want to visually walk around and inspect the boat. Um, you're looking for any type of plant, animal, mud, anything hanging on to the boat or the trailer that could harbor AIS or be an aquatic invasive species itself. Um, anything you see you just want to remove and make sure that you're taking it off and leaving it at the same water that you got it from. After that, you'd want to drain the boat anywhere that there could be water inside. Um, you want to pull the drain plug make sure you leave it out when you're transporting. Um, after that, you would want to dry the boat before going to another location if you could. If not, just make sure that you're really inspecting it well to make sure there's nothing on there. Um, you could take a towel, wipe it down. If you're not going to another location, giving it about five days to dry would be a good amount of time. 
Any particular places you think are trouble spots on a boat or a trailer that we should look for? Yeah, you definitely want to look around the motor. Um, a lot of aquatic vegetation can get caught up in the propeller. Uh, as far as your equipment goes, if you're looking at decoys, decoy lines could uh, take some veg uh, vegetation getting caught up on there. Anywhere that you've got water storage inside, you want to make sure that that's completely drained out. A lot of AIS are so small that you can't even see them with your eye and they can live in water um, for multiple days, more than five days. So what, what are the differences uh, for duck hunters versus fishermen, say, uh, when it comes to AIS prevention? I would just say the, the nature of the sport itself is going to bring up different prevention methods. Uh, whatever body of water you're visiting, you want, want to be a little bit knowledgeable about what could possibly be in the water there. With hunters, you're looking at maybe possibly having waders and boots that don't have a felt sole. The equipment itself can just, since you're working in vegetation quite often, if you're cutting vegetation for blinds, make sure that you're cutting it above the water surface and you're not transporting that to other places with you. Mostly with hunting, you're looking a lot with vegetation and your smaller snails and mussels where you're not worrying too much about the fish species like you would be with fishermen or anglers. What about the time of year when it's when it's this cold out? Is it harder for some of these invasive species to survive in this or, or stay alive? That's actually a very interesting topic. Um, there's a lot of aquatic vegetation in this area that actually grows and lives under the ice and in cold water. You're looking at um, curly leaf pondweed, milfoils, those things that can get caught up in your, your boats, your decoy anchors. Um, those things are thriving in the winter still and they can be transported and can start new populations with just a fragment. So those are things you definitely want to watch for. You definitely want to check um, all around the anchor, make sure you're checking the line for any type of AIS. So in general, when you're leaving a location and you're making sure you check everything, you also want to be checking before you put in a new location. Um, kind of just a clean in, clean out mentality and just make sure you're double checking everything. Specifically the faucet snail is one you want to watch out for. It's a very small snail and it's um, a host to different parasites, three different types of intestinal parasites. So a lot of diving ducks will forage for these and once they eat them, they get infected and it's been known to cause significant die off in diving ducks and coots. So that's definitely one that's gonna have a pretty big impact on the hunting community. So it's another reason we wanna be extra careful to watch for AIS and prevent them in our waters. Thanks for joining me today. Today is my favorite recipe, and I'm gonna bet it becomes yours too, and I wanna show you from step to step how we're doing that. It's mac and cheese and rabbit. Mac and cheese and rabbit. Everybody I know loves mac and cheese, and I wanna show you a recipe that I have that works really well for me. Take my noodles. On the recipe, I'm telling you to use a quarter cup. Once you've cooked that, it's gonna puff up. You should end up with at least a third a cup or a little bit larger, all right? And to that, you're adding this mix. In the recipe, I talked about the six, six slices of American cheese. You gotta have some sort of butter, some sort of fat with it, uh, or margarine, and then you're gonna have to have some sort of milk to help cream it out. Now, that's where this recipe becomes so fun, because you get the creaminess along with this flavor that's happening right here which is somewhat neutral. So I could add anything I really want to rabbit. Rabbit has a very unique flavor, but it's rather neutral flavor. Here's an example. This is from the back portion of the rabbit. That's where most of the meat is gonna be. A lot of the little skinning stuff around the rib cage. I've saved it, I got it. I'll do something with it. I'm thinking stuffing it and rolling it. But in this case, this is prime, prime product right here. And I just wanna fry it. I'll use a little mixture of butter and a touch of oil because I gotta watch that flash point. If I use all butter, then it'll get a little too dark. You, you guys know what I mean. But here we go, we we'll just, uh, that's the taste tester right there. So we start that off. I've got one about done. I wanna show you if I take all of this material here and I put it in a saucepan and I'm gonna do it on low heat after I've poached the noodles, of course, this is what I end up with. Now, this is the recipe I'm showing you right now. This is what it looks like. That's what happens. Beautiful, creamy, macaroni flavor. I love it. Now, I know I'm partial to stuff like, uh, I think in the recipe I wrote Velveeta. You could use a different 
American cheese, you just might have to add a little more butter, maybe a little more water uh, or something to that or a little more milk because it may not have the same melting properties as this has. I also had pickled some carrots, which I want to just add a little bit of a garnish. All right, now here becomes the twist in today. I'm going to take the rabbit breast that's already done here. I'm going to put a little bit of caramel. Now the reason I'm using that, you know we all have this in our fridge. We've used it for ice cream, but I just want a little drizzle on top. It's going to add a little bit of sweetness. The thought here is I'm getting that sweet salty because I've added seasoning to this. That's going to marry with the mac and cheese. Flip it over for a moment. Flip it back. Okay, now I've got it on both sides. Now we're ready to plate this. So let's take this and marry it with the rest of the plate. And it's going to be ready for the crew to try. <laughs> I want you to try this at home too. See what you think. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live wide open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected.